right, well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Rickman, and I'm the manager of policy with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters here in Peterborough. Environment and Climate Change Canada recently made a suite of changes to migratory bird regulations in an effort to uh, modernize and update them to better respond to the current challenges facing migratory birds. These new regulations came into effect uh, on January, excuse me, July 30th, 2022. And given the scope and the impact of the changes, we thought that a webinar would be a great opportunity to have the experts at the Canadian Wildlife Service walk us through them and their implications for hunters. So a couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin. Um, in order to keep the discussion manageable, uh, attendees will not be able to turn on their video or audio. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section below and we'll do our best to answer them at the appropriate time. That might be during the presentation, it might be in the Q&A section afterwards. Uh, we'll start things off with a short presentation from Chris Roy. Chris is the acting manager of the Migratory Birds and Wildlife Health section with the Canadian Wildlife Service. He and his team in the National Capital Region work mainly on migratory bird regulations, harvest management, incidental take, and Indigenous engagement. Uh, we received some questions from attendees at the time of registration, so I'll do my best to ensure that we cover those off with Chris as he works his way through the presentation. And following Chris's presentation, we'll have a Q&A period where we will try, pardon me, we will try to answer as many of your questions as you can. So joining Chris tonight to help answer those questions are Jack Hughes. Uh, Jack is the manager of wildlife and habitat assessment with CWS Ontario. Uh, we at the OFH have a long standing relationship with Jack actually, uh, mainly through our participation on the Ontario Waterfowl Advisory Committee. But also Jack has been very gracious and gracious enough to present at past conferences and other OFH advisory committee meetings. Uh, we also have Bridget Collins, who manages the aquatic unit in CWS Ontario region, uh, which is largely responsible for monitoring and management of migratory game birds in Ontario. And she's been with the CWS for over 20 years now. And finally, we have Craig Smith, Senior National Training Officer with Wildlife Law Enforcement with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Craig is based in Sackville, New Brunswick. Um, he spent eight years as a Provincial Conservation Officer in New Brunswick, seven years with uh, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada enforcing commercial, recreational, and Aboriginal fishing regulations, and is an avid hunter, angler, and trapper. So we are um, supremely lucky to have all four of you as panelists tonight, so thank you for being here. That's all I have to say by way of introduction. So I'll uh, uh, ensure that the uh, video is being recorded or the web webinar is being recorded and I will kick it over to you, Chris, to uh, walk us through the changes. Thanks, thanks for our Chris. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully everything will go well. So I would imagine that uh, everybody can see my screen. Yes. Yes, thanks Mark. Uh, <laughs> So thank you for attending like uh, this webinar. Uh, we're happy to talk to you about the modernization of the migratory bird regulation. So as Mark pointed out, I'm Christian Roy. Uh, I work in the National Capital Region. We're going to do a short presentation about like the change we made to the regulation, uh, and we're going to take pause at every section to give the uh, opportunity of people to ask us questions. And so I'm going to start the presentation. And so. <laughs> We've been working for quite a few years at trying to uh, change the uh, the regulation. Uh, it was a, a long process because the, the migratory bird regulations themselves dated from 1917, 1917. So they were like at some point more than 400 years old. And so the language was uh, a little bit complicated and uh, there was a lot of issues regarding the uh, indigenous right and uh, like modifying the, the, like the regulation was a, was a long process. There was a lot of work with uh, the Department of Justice. And so finally, uh, this summer, we managed to like push the package through and get everything done. So the main things we were trying to address was like increased clarity, facilitate the interpretation and compliance of the migratory birds regulation, improve the ability of effective manage management of migratory birds in Canada, particularly for migratory game birds hunting. <clears throat> and also address various issues that have been raised either by the wildlife enforcement or by hunters and stakeholders. So this is phase one of the modernization. 
And so uh, the phase one did not address for the most part permits. We did add one permits and made minor modifications to existing permit, but there's going to be more work that's going to be done on the microbridge regulation. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but that should affect mainly the industry and not uh, hunters for that future phase of the modernization. So we're still working on, on new phase of the modernization, but like uh, the most important part for like the member of, of like that are here today, like uh, the hunting's regulations have, have been like one of the main focus of the phase one. So uh, most of the change should have happened by, by now. So one of the big things that we've uh, introduced in the modernization, uh, so there's kind of a two types of change that we've made. There's things that we've introduced, so this is new stuff, and there's things that we've clarified because there were issues in the past that were raised by either enforcement, Department of Justice, or uh, hunters themselves. So one thing that is completely new is the uh, what we call the uh, the yacht permit. So. Now, for, from now on, if you're under, under 18 years old, it's possible to get the, like, the micro game bird earning permit and the stamp for free. So you need to use the website. Uh, so there's not going to be like sold at various like point on paper, but you can buy them on, on the like on a website. Uh, obviously, this has been a request for a long time for a lot of people. Uh, it was mainly done to increase like recruitment. Uh, so we're hoping that the people that will get the permit for free will actually, once they get above 18 years old, keep buying the permits and keep hunting uh, waterfall or migrating birds. And so we're hoping that this is going to be an efficient uh, tool for recruitment. So you get the permit for free, but there are like rules that apply. So you need to be mentored by somebody who already purchased the migrating bird permit. So if you have a yacht permit, you need to be with a mentor. Uh, it's still possible for people under 18 years old. If, if some people that are close to 18 don't want to go hunting where they're at for some reason, uh, they still can buy the migrating bird hunting permit and then you don't need a mentor. But if you're taking the yacht permit, you need the mentor, but you need a mentor in the blind with you or like, you know, what you're practicing your activities. So, uh, it's going to give like young hunter an opportunity to hunt with people who teach them the ropes. Uh, in exchange, though, we we uh, repealed the waterfall heritage days that were there in the past. We're hoping that the micro birds permit, micro game birds permit for for young people is going to be a more efficient recruitment tool. It's also a tool that will be allowing us to track more closely like how efficient this tool is. Uh, and so in the future, if we if we see that like it's not delivering the expected outcome, like we will reconsider like well, what's going on and we might like reconsider their bar for our edition in the future. But for the moment, like we're uh, betting strongly on using like the migrant game but earning permit for the out to actually recruit hunters. So it's technically not a new permit, it's the same permit. It's just that we're waiving the fee if you're under 18 years old. Uh, like I said, you must be accompanied. You must be accompanied by a, by a, a mentor. In Ontario, like it's a one for one match. So like you need one mentor and one people who has a yacht permit because of provincial regulation. Each hunter have their own possession limit and their bag limit. So like you know you can be boat hunting with a shotgun, like in hunting, like you know for your like bag limit without like, you know, having to like split with it, like with your mentee. Uh, and like I said, like the, the permit is only available through the e-permitting system. <clears throat> so one thing that I should mention about the like yacht hunting permit is that if you're 17 years old, when you buy the permit, it's still valid for the entire year. So like if you like if you once you've bought your permit, like it's good for the entire year. So if you like if you I guess have your 18th birthday during the hunting season, but you already acquired your permit, it's gonna be good for the entire year. However, the next year you're gonna have to pay for your hunting permit. So I don't know, like Mark, do you do you think uh, you have questions? I, I know like there was a uh, Ryan that had a questions in the Q and A's, but I think I addressed his questions. Do you think it was clear enough? Uh, yeah, there's. This is actually probably um, the section where we received the most uh, interest and the and the most questions. Uh, I think you did um, a great job of capturing most of them. 
I will say though, there's probably um, um, uh, some validity in trying to clarify some of those things. You say that a, a mentor obviously has to have a valid hunting permit for that year and they have to have purchased one in a previous yeah. year. So it can't be the mentor's first year buying yeah, we, a hunting like, permit. So how far back would that apply? That, it's that only one year. It's only one year. So if you bought a permit like last year, like this year you can be a mentor. Obviously, if this year is the first year you buy a permit, we would prefer that you get experience, you know, for a year mm -hmm. with people that will take you out for hunting before you become a mentor for like the mentee. So it's only a one year like kind of like delay before you can act as a mentor. We felt like it would be like, you know, uh, a more realistic way to approach things than letting somebody who has never hunted micro game birds to act as a mentor for a, for a young person. Right now, if somebody has spent 20 years hunting migratory game birds, but hasn't hunted in the last five or 10 and hasn't bought a permit, would that person still be allowed to mentor somebody yes. with a youth permit? Yes. Okay. So it doesn't really matter how many years have um, elapsed since they last purchased their um, yeah. migratory game bird license? Yeah, but you have, you have to have bought like previously uh, a migratory right. game bird permit. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Obviously, like it would be preferable for like the mentor to have like recent experience, but like you know, there's there's plenty of uh, grandfather out there that you know might have an occasion to bring like their grandsons for hunting, and for some reason they didn't hunt in the previous year. So like if they hunt like you know with their grandson and they already previously hunted migrate game birds, like it's it's not going to be an issue. Right, and um, can you, you you mentioned that. Um, as a result of making the youth permit free, CD CWS has abolished waterfowl heritage days. Can you walk us through maybe a little bit of the insights, some of the conversations that occurred and some of the, the rationale behind um, repealing that? Is there a reason that those two things couldn't exist at the same time? Why we could like, still have heritage days and yeah, a free we, permit for youth? We were concerned about like there was there was too many concerns it was creating confusion like having people go into the field for the waterfall heritage days without a permit and and obviously like you know we think like since the permit is for free it kind of resolved like one of the big issues for like you know kind of recruitment there was also like a lot of disparity into like kind of the, the like the programs for recruitment like in like, the waterfall heritage days so it's not it's not to say that like right now like we're not we don't think it was a good idea or it was a good program uh like i said like right now we want to see the effect of the migrating game bird hunting permit for for young people for free like we're going to be able to track this directly because like now all those permits are going to be bought online so this this resolved one of the issues we have with the paper permit is that you know sometimes the the, the applications for the paper permits are not filled completely and so we're missing information and we have difficulty tracking recruitment and retention through time. And so uh, but this, this tool is going to be able to allow us to like better evaluate the situation. I think Jack wants to chime in. Sure, yeah, please. Sorry, just trying to get myself unmuted and on video. Maybe I can't get on video. Uh, I can get unmuted though. Um, no, I do have to hit another button, start my video. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say uh, to Mark, uh, to you and the and the other folks on the call that um, although the Waterfowler Heritage Day was popular among some people, and uh, it was popular, it wasn't universally popular. There were people that were not too happy about the Waterfowler Heritage Day because they had their opening day site kind of busted the week before that they were going to hunt. And so um, there were Anyway, that was another factor. I just yeah. you want to hear all the kind of discussions that we had before making the decision, and that that also uh, factored into it. That's fair. Yeah, thanks for that uh, clarification, Jack. Um, in in uh, relation to the stamp itself, uh, I don't know who if it's Jack or or Christian who would respond to this, but you know there was a time when. Um, when they first started attaching the stamp essentially electronically to your permit, you could request to have a stamp sent to you and you would pay an additional surcharge of, if I recall correctly, it was $2 to have it sent to you, a physical stamp. Now, does that opportunity still exist for um, uh, the folks who take up the opportunity for the youth permit, the free youth permit? Can they have something physical sent to them or is everything strictly electronic uh, with respect to the youth permit? 
uh, I'm pretty sure you can still like order the stamp, but you know, like like previously, it's an additional step. Uh, it's an additional step when you actually buy the permit. You would need to right. indicate that you want the stamp mailed to you. But I can get back to you uh, about this, like make sure that I'm not saying anything like wrong. But I'm pretty sure like it's just the issue. It's one of the things when like I guess when people order electronically by default, what we apply is the electronic stamp. And when you you actually order like your permit, you need to clearly indicate like at the end of the process that you want the like the real stamps to be being mailed to you. Right. Fair enough. Um, so here in Ontario, uh, this this obviously wouldn't necessarily apply um, across Canada the same way that uh, you know the scope of some of your conversations are going to apply. But here in Ontario, um, you know, a sixteen year old uh, here in the province can purchase a license and hunt alone, for instance, with a bow or under a crossbow under these new rules um, for migratory birds. So would that 16 year old hunter in Ontario be required to purchase a normal permit in this circumstance or is the free youth permit available to them for migratory bird hunting with the, you know, the requirements of having a mentor and so on and so forth? It, it depends on what the 16 years old relationship with his dad is, I guess. If he wants to rent alone, he needs to like have his own like migration permit. If otherwise, if he if he wants, if he's comfortable like hunting, you know, with a mentor, then then he could buy his yacht permit and still hunt with any kind of equipment. Okay, perfect. Um, let me just double check, make sure there's no uh questions. I guess it's 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 like it's really, I guess I went through this slide for the, kind of quickly, but it's the same permit. It's It gives you all the same right and all the same, like, you know, it's, it's all the same rules that apply to the migrant game birds permit for an adult. The only difference is that you have to be, like you need to be with a mentor and it's free. Perfect. Okay, I think um, uh, I'll uh, allow you to continue here in a moment. Thank I'll you. double check the Q&A to see if there are any related questions um, that okay. we might be able to address in our later conversation about this, but please proceed. Thank you. So I guess you're still seeing my screen. So we're gonna go to hunting equipment. So in this section, a lot of the things that we did is that we kind of clarified the rules instead of adding like uh, stuff. We did add the crossbow to the regulations, but for the most part, it's like, we just made sure that the rules were more clear. Like I said, like the previous regulations were written in 1917. So like the language might have been a little bit confusing. So now, it should be very clear to every hunter that you can have more than one shotgun while you're hunting, you know, in your blind, but the extra shotgun needs to be unloaded, either disassemble, disassemble or kept in a case. So like, you know, you can't have access to it. It's also like, I think pretty everybody know these rules, but like, you know, for waterfall hunting, you're only allowed like to have only three shells in your shotgun. Uh, we clarified this because there was some lack of clarity in the past for particularly for like shotguns that have like a magazine. So you can have like one shell in the shotgun and two shell in the magazine. And also like, you know, we made sure to clarify like the use of toxic shock. So none of this like should be a big surprise to hunters. Like all those things were clear before. We just like clarified the language and the regulation. So like I said, uh, this is kind of a, a new thing, so we added crossbow. We already had bows that were allowed. Uh, and so the only thing that we changed though is that uh, we added like weight restrictions. And for those, like we consulted like our provincial partners to look at what were like the uh, kind of weight restrictions or like, you know, kind of, you know, what were they were doing for small games and like other like kind of animals. And so we like kind of flew with like kind of the same rules. And we also like clarified what kind of like blades you should be using for like um, hunting like uh, migrate game birds. So like the regulations now have uh, like weight and uh, blades that are like clearly identified when you hunt migrate game birds. And so do we have questions about equipment? Is that clear? Um, we had a couple of questions about the rationale behind the um... Uh, the minimum 22 millimeter uh, size for those blades. Is there any, um, you mentioned in that previous slide that, you know, some of this is aligning with, um, yeah. you know, other existing regulations and rules. So is, is there anything more than that? It, it, does it's, it come down to the killing power um, for big guess, birds or? 
two times there were reports of people using like practice like arrows or stuff like that. And so we had a few incidents and that's quite a few years back of like, you know, gender geese in a park with like arrows stuck to their neck and stuff like that. And they were clearly like inappropriate arrows for hunting migratory game birds. So uh, as usual, like, you know, sometimes like, you know, I guess the good hunters pay for the bad hunters is that we really clarify like what kind of equipment you should be using to make sure that like, you know, whenever you hit the birds, you have an ethical kill and that you don't cripple the birds and kind of cross like kind of all kind of issues. So so it was simply like the, the reason why we added it, like we were modifying the migrant birds regulations. That was a good opportunity to do that change. And like I said, like we kind of like looked at what was being done like in Canada and the United States regarding like small games and upland games were then decided to follow kind of the same regulations that were already in place. Okay, perfect, thanks. Thank you. And so uh, we did clarify also the regulations regarding uh, to use equipment regarding drones. So uh, there was a lot of concerns expressed in the past about the emergence of drones. Obviously in 1917, it wasn't too much of a concern, but now, now it is. And so we prohibited like drones while hunting. We didn't prohibit the possessions of drones like, you know, completely, but you can't use them while you're hunting. And we also clarified the prohibition about like, you know, boats definition of moving, because there was a lot of confusion in the past, like, you know, about, you know, when you can shoot the birds, like, uh, while you're in a boat. So now, like, you know, it's really clear that, like, you know, if there's motion imparted by a motor or sail, you shouldn't be hunting. So the, the boat has to be completely be, uh, like, not moving so that you don't, you don't, like, you know, you're, you can't hunt while the, bo the boat is moving. The only exception for that, it doesn't really uh, concern the people from Ontario, but I kept it on the side is that for mer hunting in Labrador and Newfoundland, because obviously while you are out at sea and hunting, like, uh, like it's kind of important to keep the power on. And so like, you know, crippled birds can be retrieved by using a moving boat. So if you're trying to capture a boat, uh, a crippled bird that is crippled, then you can definitely like, you know, use the power of the boat to kind of get to him and then like bring him in the boat and finish him off. Sorry, does that only apply in for mer hunting, or is that? Oh no, that's that's for in general. Like, yeah, yeah to dispatch a wounded bird. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So perfect. You made it clear. Yeah. Perfect. Now, is there any any time when a drone can be used in the hunt? Can it can it be used prior to taking your guns out of the case, for instance, or on your way to your hunting blind, or is there is there ever a time when it can be used? Yeah, I mean. If you're not hunting, and for example, you want to take a cool picture of like your spread and your gun is not out of the case, it's locked and you know, it's the, at the end of the hunt and like, you know, you had a good day and all your hunting equipment is like secured and you want to take pictures of like, you know, your like kind of like your, the, the dispositions of your decoy, then that could be doable. Like, but you have to be careful to not harass the birds while you're doing that. So this is another thing. It's like we've clarified the prohibitions regarding like harassment for migratory birds. And so it's really, really easy to spook birds. And when I think of birds, like it's not just like game birds, we're thinking of all the birds. So you have to be very careful now when you're using a drone, but even if you're not hunting, if you're like during, I don't know, summer or the spring, like you know we're very concerned about like the use of drones right now and so it's something that people have to be keep in mind when you're using like your drones not to spook uh, at least my green members but like wildlife in general perfect thanks so a big change a big introduction is the kind of like the concept of preservation so this is brand new and so once your birds that are harvested are preserved they don't longer count in your possession limits. And so there's an exception for MERS because we still have concerns about like their harvest right now. But like, so they don't count in your possession limit, but they still count in your daily bag limit. So like, it doesn't like processing the birds during the day, preserving the birds during the day doesn't waive your daily bag limit. But not like in terms of possession, like, you know, anything will like that is preserved will, will not count during through your possession limit. 
So the question that a lot of people ask us now is like, obviously, okay, how do I preserve the birds? So there's a two steps for that. So if you're in your blind or on the hunting like, you know, spot and you pluck and eviscer the birds, this is allowed as long as you keep a wing or a head feathered so that they can be identified later on while you're moving them. But the full conservation to be properly preserved, you need to either freeze the bird, made into sausage, cook it, dry it, can, smoke in a location other than denting area, or you can mount them for taxidermy. So the idea is really like you need to cook the birds or freeze them, put them in the freezer so that like with their consider like fully preserved. So like, you know, you, they need to be plucked, eviscerated, and then either cooked or mount or frozen so that they don't count in your possession limit anymore. And we want the like final step of the preservations to be conducted other, in an area other than the hunting area. So like, what are those area? So for like, you know, wool birds, like the first stage of preservation, like I said, like removing the viscera or like, you know, partially plugging the birds can be done in any location, including like your hunting spot. But after that, like, you know, the final stage of preservations, the freezing and the cooking parts needs to be taken like outside of the hunting area. And so if you also, if you're, if you want to breast the birds, it's the same thing. Like, you know, if you, if you only breast the birds, you need to like do it also outside of the hunting area. So it can be your residence. If you're hunting like uh, outside of like, you know, your like normal like living area, it can be uh, like a rented home, an hotel, a cabin, a campsite, a tent, a trailer, or even an RV if you're hunting from an RV. But like, you know, this like the RV can't be right next to your hunting spot. It needs to be away from there. And so it could also also be done like the final step of preservation. Like I don't think it's as popular as it is like in Ontario that it is in like some of the like Western province, but you could also like deal with uh, a plucker and a fitter or a butchers to actually process your birds. And once again, once those birds like are back in you, like in your possessions, like they don't count to your possession limits once like the plucker or like the outfitter gave you back their birds. And so do you have questions about like the preservation? Yeah, uh, they actually probably include some of the content that you're about to speak to, actually. So maybe I'll let you go ahead and talk about okay. uh, this this new amendment, and then yeah, we can this uh, is a, pause. This is a new a new thing that has been requested for a very long time by hunters, and so now you have the choice to either like keep a fully feathered head or a fully feathered wing to make sure that your birds can be identified. So you can you can do either of these things and you need those birds to be identifiable, like you know, when you're transporting them and before they're like completely like preserved. So we still have like labeling requirements. So for example, if you're hunting and you're packing your stuff and you know you give your birds to somebody else to carry it back home, like it's possible, but you need like those birds to be clearly labeled. And so one of the things we changed in the past is that each bird is needed to be labeled. And now it's possible to label the birds in a, in a group, as long as we can still like identify the birds individually. So if like somebody asks you to show you their birds, if they're in a frozen block of ice, uh, that won't work. Like, you know, we can put them in a bag together and have one tag on the, on the bag, that will work. But then, like you know, we can still like need to be able to count and identify each each birds. It's always the responsibility of the hunters to label this bird. So, like if somebody gives you their birds, like it's his responsibility to actually like make sure that they're labeled. And one of the things that is like clear now in the regulation is that the labeling requirement does not have to preserve the birds. So, like once the bird has been completely processed and it's in your freezer or it's in sausage, like there's no question about whether or not you should have a tag on it. So, does that apply to um, if you're, would you have to, or would a hunter who harvests multiple species in a given day, would they be able to throw multiple different species in a bag? You could you could do that if you want, as long as you know you clearly identify the bag as you know you're the one who wanted the birds at which dates you wanted the birds and like your permit number and a contact like point so that people can contact you. That would be one way to do it. Yes. 
and each individual bird in that bag would need to be identifiable either through a fully feathered head yeah. or an attached wing, correct? Yes. Until until it's, it's fully until, yeah. until, until it's fully preserved. Yes. Now, the 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 concept of preservation, or I guess the new definition, um, uh, is interesting. It, it can't occur, as you said, at the hunting location, which eliminates the possibility of you know a fresh meal of birds in the field I, i'm not sure i personally don't know anybody who does that with uh, migratory bird hunting i certainly don't but it's certainly common with fishing and even some deer and moose hunters um, right after they harvest their game they uh they take a chunk of the meat and and they fry it up as almost a in a ritualistic manner to celebrate the uh the successful hunt so um a do we have any sense of how widespread that practice is um, with migratory birds? And um, ultimately, what is the is, is it an enforcement reason that you wouldn't yeah. allow hunters to do that at the hunting yeah. area? It was it was it was like trying to balance everything out because we we wanted to to introduce the preservation like concept into the world, like because like obviously it's one of the things that you know kind of like people were always ask us, you know, like, you know, what happens, like, once the bird is turned into sausage, like, how do I label my sausage? Because, like, you know, <laughs> before that, like, you, each bird needed to be labeled. And so we tried to find a balance. We did get to receive a few negative comments regarding the other issue that you talked about, about, like, hunters who actually, most of the time, like, you know, kind of, like, consume one of their birds in their hunting blind or, like, very, very close to their hunting blinds. Uh, but in the end, like, you know, for the moments, like, you know, it's the, the concept of preservation is, I think, a big step forward, but there's still a little bit of conservation issues, and we want to monitor this situation or how it's going to be, like, you know, applied and how, how the hunters will react. Uh, so so we'll, we'll be monitoring the situation closely, and then, like, you know, depending, like, if we keep getting requests for it or, like, if we, if we think it's a huge issue, it's, like, then maybe, like, as, as I mentioned, like there's going to be further steps for the monetization. There's always going to be a possibility to review the regulations in the future. But for the moment, like we, we wanted to strike a balance between like you no know, conservations and liberalization. And that's why like we kind of like, I guess by default, eliminated like the possibility of like consuming a, a freshly killed bird in your mind. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh. So this is a question that like came up regularly from hunters, like what, what happened when I find a crippled bird? And so we, we, we clarified the regulation. So the situation was kind of the same before is that if you find a crippled bird that you didn't shoot, like it's kind of up to you to make up your mind. If you pick up the birds and you know, keep it, it's gonna count toward your bag limit. And so if you don't want to take it, you know, there's no obligations for you to pick it up. If it's not your birds, you don't have to pick it up. Uh, and so, so now the regulation is clear uh, and we don't want to have situation like we live in the past where somebody like were controlled by enforcement officer and were over the bag limits and then claim that, you know, they just like picked up birds that were crippled by the hunters, like the neighbors or something like that. So now the regulations are very clear about what you can and can do. And, but we kept the flexibility of letting the hunters like kind of see like, you know, how they wanted to like, I guess, like act when they, they face this situation. So training retriever dog. Uh, so there's some dog club that I have like in the past complained about the maximum limits, which was 200 per cast. And so we now allow clubs that have more than 200 like, you know, birds for training to actually register with us. So they need to fill a form with the department, there's a link on like on the website. And then uh, they just register like the place where they keep the birds, the name and location of like kind of their training club. And then it's up to them to maintain the log book. It's kind of like when people uh, are doing taxidermy, like taxidermists ever like, uh, like, you know, they need to maintain a log book of like who gives them like, you know, the birds and like what kind of birds they have like for mounting. It's kind of a similar system. However, the Canadian Wildlife Service or rather like Environment Climate Change Canada does not require the logbook to be sent to us. So you just need to maintain it. And if enforcement shows up at your door, you're gonna have to provide your logbook. 
but the only thing you do is kind of fill the form and then we enter all this into a database and so you're registered with us and if there's any issues like we know you exist and that you're over your like the like 200 limits <clears throat> so the email is uh, actually on the next slide so like you know we have like an email where you can send us, send us like information and like there's no there's 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 not a lot of you know things to 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 know the only thing that is really important is that if a species is listed under SARA, you can't use it for dunk training. So we can think, for example, in the East, like Barrow's golden eye or like Arlequin duck, those species should not be hunted. Well, Barrow's you can, but the limit is very strict. But like you should not use those birds to actually uh, train ducks. So that's it's also a request that I have. We've heard for a long time from hunters like wastage, preventing wastage. I think like Ontario has its own regulation. So now like we've applied the same concept to the migratory birds regulation. It's up to you to make sure that you use like, you know, the migratory birds that you are vested to the best of it. So either by like, you know, eating it yourself, giving it away to somebody who will eat it or by using it as a, you know, mounted ducks, taxidermy, or like training. But now we're, we're not allowing any more like wastage because we had like, uh, I guess, some very poor story in the past regarding wastage, like per, particularly like in the prairies or like with the US hunters sometimes at the border. So another thing that we clarified, so this was not added, but I guess like in the past, some hunters had, and general public had difficulty like understanding the concept. And so we clarified that if you're hunting in two different zones, like the maximum like daily bag limits that apply is the maximum, like the highest of the two. It's not a combination of the two. So if you're hunting in the bag in the hunting zone and the limit is two birds, and then you switch, I guess, in the afternoon and you go hunting to another region and like the maximum limit is three birds, well, like, you know, at the end of the day, the maximum birds you can have is three birds. So you can't add like, you know, the plus, like the, the daily bag limits together. So there's, it's going to be the, the highest of the two. So I think like we already touched this issue. So the migratory birds and transits must be individually identifiable. That's what I said. Like, you know, if you, if you want to use only one tag, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, we need to be able to still identify the different birds uh, if, if you're intercepted by a, by a conservation officer. So somebody can have your birds, like I said, uh, and like I said, like, you know, it's like, uh, it could be like, you know, either your hunting buddy that is transporting your back, your birds back to your home, or it could be a plucker, a butcher, or something like that. So it's always your, like, responsibility to label those birds to make sure that, you know, like, we can tra trace you back and you identify, like, you know, your hunting permit number, your name, and all the information necessary. And uh, sorry, just on that on that point, yeah. there, Chris. Um, what uh, what counts as temporary? I guess I, it doesn't seem like you've defined temporary here, and and maybe that's a good thing. But um, internally, have there been any discussions about, or maybe even with enforcement, have there been any discussions about? You know what exceeds uh, this definition of temporary in, in uh, the minds of enforcement. Well, I, I mean, we're going to touch gifting, which is okay, completely different. But temporary means that you know clearly, or at least like when you gave the birds, you had the intention of taking back the birds. So one like like I said, like you know, if you and your birds to somebody to transport them back home, and you're not in the car with that person, this is temporary possession. If you leave your birds at the butcher shop, like this is also temporary possession. Uh, you can take of many different scenarios where you actually leave the birds to somebody and you're not going to be present for a while. And then like you, but you do have the intention of getting those birds back. Okay, thanks. So like, uh, like we're getting to the gifting part. Uh, so you can actually gift birds uh, to somebody uh, for human consumption, for taxidermy, or for training dog. Like you know, uh, the migratory bird that is not preserved is going to come to the owner possession limit until like the gift is accepted by the recipient. And so this is what we change in the relation. It's a change when people give birds now, the recipient must accept it. 
it must be explicit. And so this was introduced because in the past there was issue where people would give birds to, I guess, the landowner where they were hunting because they were simply over the bag limit. And so they would simply drop the extra birds on the porch from the person and then say, well, I give, I give those birds to that person. And sometimes the owner were not interested in receiving birds. And so from now on, like when you give a birds, the person needs to acknowledge that you're giving them the birds and accept it. So once you're giving the birds and the person accept it, this birds, if it's not preserved, is going to come to the, this person possession limit. And so if you have like, you know, 10 birds and you're like, you know, in your possessions and they're not preserved and you give away five to your mom for like her to cook dinner for you, uh, you're now in possession limits of five birds and she's going to be in possession of five birds. So we also made a lot of clarification regarding the gifting of feathers. So, you know, you can give feathers for educational, social, cultural, or spiritual purpose. It was kind of always there is in the rule. Uh, we do not want people to use feathers for app making or ornamental use because that's kind of why we started like, you know, the micro birds convention, like it was the abuse of like people using feathers for dress and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So the only exception is obviously eider downs because it's a different type of feather and there's a permit required to collect that. So that's that's uh, there's a few more slides about permits and then we'll be done. So sure. do you have any uh, questions? Yeah, actually, there's um, a couple questions uh, as we were um, going through those slides there. Just the most recent slide actually yeah. related to gifting. Ryan's asking, you know, does the recipient of gifted birds need anything official? Do they need a license? Do they need uh, have something in writing that they've no. accepted these birds, or do they just have to no. ha have willingly accepted the birds? No, they just say like you know I, I accepted birds, and you know like that's that's going to be like more like the concern is not really with the person who are being gifted birds. It's with people who sometimes give birds and you know maybe didn't tell the other person that they were actually being the recipient of the birds. That was that was the conservation concern. So out of curiosity, and maybe this is a better question for Craig on the enforcement side, but um, if somebody is being gifted a lot of birds over time and they are in possession of quite a few birds um, and somebody raised a concern, how would a conservation officer or an enforcement officer know whether or not that person is legally in possession of those birds if they're not a hunter, for instance, if I were to gift um, a lot of my birds to a parent, one of my parents who, who are not hunters, um, how would that be approached and what kind of discretion would an enforcement officer use in dealing with a situation like that? Or is it even an issue? I think there's always a potential something like, like, like that could become an issue. Um, what we do have to remember is until the birds are preserved, the the tagging requirements so group of individual bird or the group of birds would still apply once they're preserved the possession limits no longer apply so so that's the types of things we would be looking at okay perfect thank you um going back uh probably to the beginning of the um uh uh the slide deck there chris um is there a minimum age for a uh, youth license it has to be somebody under 18 but is there a minimum or does that is that really dictated by the provincial um age I think, restriction i think we we didn't put uh nature restrictions and i would need to check to make sure but like in most cases like it's the provincial jurisdiction where the same age limit and so i don't think we we decided to double down on this issues because in all provinces and territories in Canada, you actually need to have like a provincial license to hunt migrant birds. And this is this is where the age limit is actually like uh, important. Okay, perfect. And to be crystal clear on this, because this we get this in Ontario uh, with apprenticeship hunting, uh, it'll probably almost certainly come up uh, with this new free youth permit. But if a mentor is mentoring a mentee, um, can they each have a gun? If the mentee has that free youth permit, yeah. that youth hunter yeah. can have their own shotgun yeah. as can the mentor, correct? Yeah. Unless unless there's a provincial regulation that I'm not aware of. So like, you know, I always check your provincial regulation. I don't know the, <laughs> like the provincial regulation of every province, sadly. Uh, so so, so if there's no provincial regulation, like if you have a migrate game bird permit, whether it's a it's a 
you know, you you can unfit a shotgun. So uh, you know, the Yao person would, would be allowed to unfit his shotgun and the mentee, the mentor would have his own shotgun. And um, I guess ancillary to that question about firearms, um, the requirement for the uh, youth hunter who, to have taken the relevant hunter education yes. course in yes. the province, would, that is still yes. a requirement. That yes, there, there's yeah. like all the province like have their own like kind of system. One of the neat thing I think is that, you know, they're whatever, like you follow your firearm class in Ontario, like, you know, all the other province will recognize you. So this is this is great. Uh, but you need to have your firearm classes to use a shotgun. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here trying to yeah. uh, address some people's questions. Some of these questions came in when um, attendees registered. Others are being asked in the Q&A. Some of these questions will leave until, uh, until after the presentation. But going back very quickly to the charity permit section that you mentioned, um, is there uh, you know, there, there are obviously quite a quite a few new requirements in place there, it seems like. Is there a single uh, website or PDF or source of information that we can direct uh, hunters, migratory game bird hunters, and or clubs uh, to if they, they're interested in engaging yeah, we, in this? We, like, uh, uh, all, all the information about the permits that are not the migratory game birds permits are on a single page on our website. We'll share the link with you. And you actually have the contact of every individual like permit office throughout the country so that you can like send your applications to the right office. And out of curiosity, how long um, does uh, a response take for a permit like that? I, I re recognize it's new, but is there a, a service standard that CWS is trying to meet when it comes to responding to permit applications? That's a good question. Maybe uh, Jack can remember or correct me. I think like most permits, like the service like is like something like 30 days, but like in most cases, like we rarely like reach those 30 days limit because they're for complex case. So uh, by default, I think the like service is 30 days, but like it's usually it's, like much more like quicker than that. Okay. Jack, did you have anything to add there or? Well, yeah, I, I actually, I don't know the, I, there, I'm certainly certain there is a service standard because we have service standards now for all of our permits. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Christian is right. It's probably 30 days or it could be a little, a little more, but uh, it's only when we have an application that is somehow unusual that we uh, get close to the service standard. If the permit application is incomplete or something like that, it could take longer. But most permits are issued um, well, well before the, the limit of the service standard. So I think for the most part, the, the 30 days would be a, sort of a good benchmark to take away this evening. Okay, perfect. And that's what I'm getting at. Regardless of what the service standard is, um, I'm just trying to give people a sense. And when people yeah. call or email us uh, in the future about this, uh, give them a sense of how much lead time they need to give themselves if they're yeah. planning on gifting or donating harvested birds for that purpose. It, so It looks like Bridget may actually know the answer to this. So <laughs> <laughs> we might as well get it if we have it. <laughs> Perfect. Please. Yeah, uh, no, it was a good question. I just quickly Googled it myself. And uh, the service standard is 40 calendar days. Um, oh. And there's, um, there's actually a bit more to that. 90% um, of decisions are made within 40 calendar days or 20 days before the permit is required, whichever is later. Oh, okay, so yeah, we will have to give uh, uh, people some advice to give themselves a little extra time if yeah. they plan on doing that, okay. Yeah, but Perfect. as Jack and others have said, like at least uh, in Ontario region, um, our permit service standards were usually uh, achieved much quicker than than what we're um, um, required to meet. It's usually much faster. Depends, but um, I anticipate it would be faster. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll uh, let you um, proceed for a little bit here, Chris, and then uh, maybe address uh, some of the more of these questions at the end here. So we made a change to the damage and danger permit that may be of interest of some people who can be like, you know, kind of recruited by uh, farmers to actually do the deed for them. Uh, in the past, like, you know, you couldn't uh, use the migratory game birds that were harvested under, under a damage and danger permit. And so now you're allowed to gift them uh, for I mean, consumption, to charity, for training, uh, for taxidermy if the species has an open season in Canada. So obviously it's for my three gamers that we are longest. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> the only thing is that you need to gift them. You can't keep them for yourself. And so we also made it clear for damage and danger that you need to use steel because in the past it was unclear whether you could use steel or like, uh, I guess, uh, lead shot so now like for all damage and danger permit like it's clear that you need to like use uh, non-toxic shot and then we also had to put in a definition of what is a, a decoy uh, in the migrators regulation for the most part it's not going to affect people it's just that you know under a damage and danger permit you're not supposed to like be lying in wait and you're not supposed to use be be using decoy so, so we put a definition of decoys in the regulation so that we can point out that when you're actually hunting under a damage and danger permit, you, you, you don't, you, you're not allowed to use a decoy. So in this case, uh, when people are receiving a D&D uh, &D permit, yeah. you're really trying to eliminate any semblance of regulated hunting, correct? For the moment, like, yes, this is always the approach we took, and this is the other approach we made in the MBR. Like, we do not want the damage and danger permits to become some kind of, like, for the moment, special hunt permit that would be, like, you know, kind of like, be, uh, yeah, a special kind of hunting season. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is why, like, we, we've added, like, those descriptions to make sure that, you know, people should always try to scare away the birds before they actually try to kill them under a damage and danger permit. Thanks. And so we're coming to the micro the charity permit. So this is a new thing. This is completely new. And it's the only new permit that has been introduced. So uh, we now have a charity permit. So the person who have uh, the charity permit can possess uh, preserved harvested migrating birds and they can serve them at a meal furthering fundraising dinner or uh, serve them in a meal as a soup kitchen or distribute them back food bank. So the migrating birds must have been taken under either like, you know, uh, a migrating birds or their permit, uh, damage and danger permits, or by indigenous people like Section 30 right older, Section 35 right holders. Uh, it's only allowable to, <laughs> to like, you know, have birds that are like species that are migrating birds for which there's open season in Canada. So for the charity permits. And we also like, you know, excluded species listed uh, under the Species at Risk Act uh, because we want to limit the harvest of those species. So for the charity permit, like, you know, all the birds must be preserved in order to be possessed under the charity permit. So you need to preserve the birds yourself before you give them away. Uh, there are rules that apply when the birds are served at the fundraising dinner. The fees must not be charged for the meal, although they can be a cover charge for the event itself. And the profit made from the fundraising event must be used for the conservation of life life. So those, those regulations are quite similar to a lot of like provincials kind of like regulations throughout the country right now regarding like uh, game meat like that is like under like provincial jurisdiction. The charity permit is free of charge and uh, the permit holder must keep record like of like, you know, who give them like birds and like, you know, what were the species and like how many they got and like all the listings so that we can track like, you know, what has been served during the like conservation or during the charity event. So the charity fundraiser must be related to migrant birds conservation and the profit must be related to conserve or protect wildlife in general. So it's not only to like for migrant bird conservation because we didn't want to like create a situation where there would be conflict with uh, provincial uh, regulations regarding serving, uh, I guess, game meat. And so finally, or we're really close to the end. So uh, now we redid the like hunting for like <clears throat> schedule. And you probably saw this this year when you got like the summary of like the hunting regulations from Ontario. Uh, we've removed the footnote and made the table so that all the regulations are like, you know, in a single like kind of like table and there's no like complication like the previous like I guess like you know summaries were very complicated to read and it was the same thing as in the regulation. So a uh, consequence of that is that the summaries become very long and so we had to remove all the like 
the regulations that are not under federal responsibility or should discovery. So like in the past, there was information, for example, for fact on season, but we removed them. And so this is the end. Uh, I have two more slides to go through to give you kind of a, an idea of what are the next steps. Because like I said at the beginning, like the microbiome regulations uh, are going to be keeping like updated. So there's going to be amendment for like the permit, which is what we call the short terms, or we expect to do in the short terms. Like there's going to be provisions that are mainly for the industry regarding like you know DMD permit and like the vectors nest protection. Uh, in the medium term, uh, we're going to try to address the insulin take that has been requested a lot by the industry during like the consultation between CG1 and CG2. And then uh, very long term, we would like to develop an insulin take regime uh, to actually improve the concentration of migrant birds in general, uh, but also like, you know, allow the industry to like have a little bit of breathing room regarding the regulations right now. So the next slide is, so this is a little bit of a disclaimer, but like I tried to do my best <laughs> to give you all the information that I know in a very short time. I did manage to do it under an hour and I really appreciate that people took the time to listen to my presentation. Uh, but you know, not all the other nets were presented. I really focused as others I could on like the regulation regarding to hunting, but there's a lot of things that have been changed. So don't be shy and do, do, do take a look at our websites. We have a lot of information on the website about what has changed for like migrant birds conservation in general. And if there's any inconsistency between the presentation and the regulation, the later we prevail. So are there any additional questions? Awesome. Thanks for uh, that very detailed presentation, uh, Christian. Um, there are quite a few questions. Um, I'm sure there are still some related to your presentation. There are probably some related to, or that are maybe outside the scope of what you presented, maybe more about Ontario regulations that we might have to throw over to, uh, to Jack or Bridget or, or someone else. But um, but before we go any further, I do want to thank you for uh, that detailed information. So um, very quickly, going back to the, uh, the the charity permit and the gifting of birds, um, yeah. do donated birds, are there any requirements for the inspection of meat when, when donated birds or birds are donated, I should say? There's no federal regulations to the best of my knowledge, but we know that there are regulations in every province and some at, the, at this moment, like it's a little bit of a patchwork, some like province are going to be able to like you know approve the use of my game bird meat like during charity events because they are the like the province has rules that are very general regarding serving like uh, game meat. Other province might have regulations that are like targeted specifically at the like games that are like under provincial jurisdiction. And so in those instances, like you know, there's going to be a need to engage like the provincials like jurisdictions to kind of like add the micro game bird meat to the like list of like meat that can be served at the, at the charity event. So at this point, it really depends on where people are in the province. Yeah. Or excuse me, yeah. in, in the country, yeah. in what province they're in. So yeah. it, with respect to, I mean, we have representatives from CWS Ontario region here, just out of curiosity, if I were interested in uh, donating birds to a fishing game club and they were interested in getting a charity permit for an event, um, would they get those details from CWS Ontario? Or would they have to go to say the provincial ministry of natural resources or forestry or even some the cfia for instance canadian food inspection agency for the details on what they are required to do with those with that meat prior to uh um preparing it and serving it yeah so i can answer uh, mark they, they would have to go to the the provincial authorities to get that information yeah okay yeah perfect um, <clears throat> I'm going to throw it over uh, in a moment to my colleague, Matt DeBell, to see if he has any um, uh, key questions from the Q&A. Um, but we had, this is a, a question, uh, I guess a topic that wasn't even in your presentation, um, but back in 2018, 
Um, CWS proposed a service fee increase for migratory game bird hunting permits and, and the conservation uh, stamp. And I know that at the time, the, uh, the Federal Hunting and Management Advisory Panel uh, recommended that too. Um, that, that has been sort of stagnant. Um, uh, can you provide us, is there even an update on where that proposal stands and is it even being discussed internally anymore? Is that something that we can- It's still, it's, oh, it's, still, <laughs> it's definitely on my agenda. Uh, <laughs> I definitely had a conversation about that. So like, you know, if I remember correctly the order event, like in 2018, like, you know, we did like engage like the public in general, we did consultation. Most of the people were very supportive. And so the issue though, is that when kind of this like a package went up, like we ended up in election season and then we just like, you know, when the elections were over, like, you know, kind of rebuilding the package, then there was COVID, then the modernizations took priority because we didn't want to have too many different package trying to address like the Mike Rivers regulations themselves, like in mm -hmm. the system to avoid like conflict like it was already complicated enough to complete the modernization but yes it's definitely still on the agenda because like you know we had a solid ground for like the increase of the fee like we had the very good support so i would expect that you know hopefully in the next you know few years or even like months we're going to be able to restart this process like our web page is still up like saying that we're like you know taking time to analyze things and and such uh, because it's been so long since we've broached the subject with the public, it's been now more than four years, like there might be a need to redo a consultation depending on right. Treasury Reports regulation. Uh, but yeah, definitely this is something that is on the agenda. Uh, we have not given up on this, at least, you know, at the working level. And uh, you'll definitely hear more about this soon, I hope. Perfect. Uh, a couple big um, uh, issues for folks, at least issues that people seem to be very interested in and or concerned about uh, two things. I'll ask you a few questions on each. First being uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, high path AI, and uh, baiting authorizations. So how about we uh, start with uh, high path AI? Are there any recommendations for uh, hunters, uh, chefs, or how to protect your dog when handling waterfowl as they relate to uh, avian influenza? So uh, we're going to share a link with you and the Public Health Agency of Canada has, has some recommendations like, you know, for hunters, like if you're going to handle like birds and you're not sure whether they're infected or not, uh, you know, always work in a well ventilated environment, you know, try to stay like do the work outdoor if possible. If you're doing it indoor, try to have a very well ventilated, like, you know, kind of like place where you work, uh, avoid direct contact with like the feces and like the like secretion because this is how like, you know, the, the influenza is transmitted. Uh, don't eat and drink uh, while you're processing the bird this year. I'm not saying it's like you should never do it or at least that you should have never done it in the past, but this year particularly, I'd be careful. <laughs> Uh, wear rubber glove while you're doing pr the processing of your birds this year. Once you're done, like, you know, wash your hand immediately. If you have blood on your clothes, like, you know, put them in the washer immediately. Same thing. Try to keep, like, you know, children's and pets away while you're processing the birds this year because, like, you don't know if the birds are, are being affected or not. And then, you know, clean your working surface as much as possible once you're done. So, like, this is the general recommendation right now. Uh, in terms of like retrieving dog, we do not have a lot of information. Uh, the hunting uh, association in England did make some recommendation, you know, and so try not to let the dog like, you know, play too much with birds that are dead or like, you know, seems to be sick. Like if you, it's not a bird that you shot yourself, like kind of be very wary of like, you know, letting your 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 dog and all those birds. Uh, birds, like dogs have not been known to contact like, you know, avian influenza, but we had a few cases this year with like seals in the Atlantic regions which did contact like avian influenza because this strain seems to be particularly virulent. So yeah, like try to minimize like contacts with the birds. Uh, like I know <laughs> at least my dog like sometimes to eat like to eat like uh goose poop in the park sometimes uh bad idea particularly this year so a little bit <laughs> on this part 
yeah, well, like, you know, where we're like, you know, for like, for retriever dogs, like, you know, it's going to be difficult to avoid all contacts with birds, but try to minimize like the contact. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's pretty much, yeah, also like in terms of like, like the migratory birds, like also public health cat, like really recommend like to cook the game meat too early. So at least like 165 degrees Celsius, 74 degrees Celsius, uh, it's done to well done. So uh, I guess no, no rare meat this year. Some people would call that ruined. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't want to say it, right? But yeah, uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, this year, I guess there's going to be more pilgies than there were used to be in the past or more sausage or more stuff like that. Yeah, yeah fair. And I know that um, the U.S. has prohibited the import of harvested migratory birds from Canada due to concerns about high path AI. Um, is Canada doing anything to or, maybe change that, or is Canada even doing touch. anything internally to to oh, yeah. um, uh, sort of prohibit the the movement of harvested birds? Yeah, we're we're in touch with the Department of Agriculture. Like, uh, I think like you know they announced like they made a big announcement like last Friday, right before the long weekend. We were I guess a little bit surprised by it because we had a lot of discussion with them. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife is also having discussion with the Department of Agriculture because those are two different entities and they have, I guess, different perspective on like whether or not like the micro game birds that are been harvested or in cooler should be like allowed to cross the border. So yeah, we, we've been in touch with them and we're still, still trying to like, you know, encourage them to the fact that, you know, we think that micro birds that are being harvested that have like, that are in cooler are like, you know, probably not as like dangerous as the birds themselves that are crossing the border on their own will. Uh, and we're gonna keep engaging them. But then again, like, you know, they're in another country and they're in another department. And so like, you know, we can have a lot of conversation, but at the end, they're the one making the decision. So uh, like, we can't make any guarantees of being the future, but it's definitely on our agenda. Okay, that's fair. Now, uh, you know, within Canada, are there any restrictions on the movement of harvested birds, currently, say from Manitoba yeah. to into, back into Ontario? Yeah. Currently, there are no restrictions. Obviously, if you look at our website, like, you know, we link, like, you know, uh, the agency that's in charge of, like, of putting such regulations, because it's possible that at some point, like, you know, if, like, we have a very, like, bad outbreaks during the fall, uh, when all the birds are going to be migrating, if if there are huge outbreaks, there might be restrictions put in. But at the moment, like everything is like I would say, like you know, kind of light green, and so there's no restriction in place. Okay, perfect. Um, now pivoting a little bit to something that is, we've probably received more questions and concerns about um, the decision to uh, stop issuing baiting authorizations for this year as a result of uh, high path AI. So they're they're suspended for this year. Um, can you maybe provide folks with uh, some justification of the biological rationale and some of the discussion that might have happened internally um, in reaching that decision to uh, to not issue them this year? The transmission like of like avian influenza is like true like oral fecal like you know pathway and so obviously if you're baiting and the birds congregate at one place and they eat like you know the bait and then like they're going to be like also like pooping at the same place this is this is like a, a huge concern and so for the moment like given how bad the outbreak was in the last you know few months we decided to try to restrict any kind of activity that would like get the birds to congregate. And we also like, you know, sent a very strong message to our social media to like, to everybody to try to avoid those situations. It's particularly like problematic for baiting because like from, for waterfall, because like the bait is in the water. And so like it does spread like the avian influenza a lot more efficiently than if it's on the ground where like, you know, the like the feces are not gonna be dissolved and dispersed in the like column of water. And so that was a, a, a huge concern for us. Like we also like, you know, we do some banding, but there's like protocol are very like stringent. And in fact, like in the last few days, we've had to cancel some banding operation because some of the birds that were actually captured for the banding operations were infected. And so we don't want to like, you know, kind of have like those, those banding stations to be like kind of like congregating birds anymore. And obviously it's kind of 
give us a big challenge because now we're going to have to capture birds without you know doing the traditional way we're doing banding which is bathing station because that we still need like the banding information the banding like does provide a very critical source of information for us like survival and like you know things like that and harvest and so so it was a trade-off like the only reason we maintain like banding is because like it has a very high scientific purpose and like I said, like, you know, we're monitoring the situation very closely right now at the banding station. And if like when things go wrong, when like we detect IHPI, like we just close the banding station and stop doing it. And so there's a few people right now that are, uh, I guess, few, a few field biologists that have to like imagine new ways to ban birds without, <laughs> without their traditional methods. Okay, thanks. Now, obviously, you know, we're all concerned about uh, the impact of avian influenza on, on all bird populations, uh, including migratory birds and uh, game it's, birds. Now, uh, are there, like, I mean, some, some areas in Ontario specifically um, really benefit, and the bird populations in, in, the, in those areas really benefit from baiting authorizations and that practice. Is there any sense of what might be the um, the long term, maybe even short term and long term implications um, of not issuing baiting authorizations on places like uh, you know Long Point or Hollett Marsh or, or places like that that are extremely valuable to uh, to migratory birds. Yeah, like for the moment, like this was a short term decision. Like we like suspended baiting authorization for one year because like we're in the like tick of it, and we're going to need to reevaluate it in the future. Obviously, like, you know, if, if the switch situation like keeps like at the same level and next year we're going to have to like, you know, reevaluate the situation, like it's, it's still a concern of us. Like, you know, we do not deny the importance of like long point waterfalls and those, those areas. So uh, it's an ongoing situation. We're going to need to reevaluate the situation in the future. And obviously at some point we're going to have to find an alternative. But like you mentioned, like, I guess one of the concerns we had this year, because avian inflation happened before, there were there were epidemic like, and you know, usually waterfall do do very good. Like waterfall species are kind of like exposed to like avian influenza a lot because, like I said, like they kind of eat and poop at the same place. So like they're mm -hmm. the prime target species for like avian influenza. But this this like epidemic is particularly bad, and there's a lot of species of migratory birds and like uh, birds like that are more like under third, like provincial jurisdictions that have been infected that never really like showed sign of like being susceptible to avian influenza. So like you know for the moment like all the signs are in the red, and we're gonna see like the fall is gonna be critical because there's gonna be a lot of migration, and so there's a lot of congregation of different species during the fall. So it's gonna give us a good signal of like how this new virus is gonna like kind of like, I guess, progress and install itself in, in North America because it's a new strain. And at some point we expect the like white population to adapt to it. Okay, so that's that's related to baiting authorizations, a yeah. permit that is issued by CWS, but nothing to be crystal clear, nothing has changed with respect to the previous baiting regulations, you know, the, you know, placing bait up to 14 days prior to a season and all of those uh, previous regulations are still in place. Nothing has changed in that regard. Yeah, we, we, we did change the language of the text a little bit to make it crystal clear that you need to stop baiting like 14 days before the start of the hunting season. Uh, but other than that, like for the baiting right now, we, we haven't like changed the regulations for that. Okay, now back in, um, I want to say 2017, maybe, I think there was a discussion about, a uh, consultation maybe even about uh, potentially restricting the practice of baiting. So outside of the baiting authorizations, but the practice of baiting by hunters uh, for the purposes of hunting. So at the time, if I recall correctly, CWS actually considered discontinuing the issuance of baiting authorizations in perpetuity and to prohibit the deliberate modification of um, agricultural crops um, uh, for the purposes of attracting migratory birds for hunting. Uh, nothing has, um, uh, has changed in that regard, uh, but are those discussions still ongoing internally? Is that something that, um, that folks are still uh, potentially considering changing? I don't, I don't recall like, and maybe Jack can chime in like recently having discussion or like baiting authorization. I think we proposed that, like you said, in 2017 and there was a lot of negative feedback. So for the moment, like, you know, we didn't reconsider or like uh, 
think of like doing any more like you know engagement on this subject. Uh, that being said, like you know, like you mentioned, like you know, like we're like so this year we suspended the baiting authorization, and we're hoping that like things are going to become better in the future. If if there's like if there's concern about the in the future about like any kind of like strain of baiting and influenza, of course we're going to need to redo our own work and re-engage people and try to figure out a solution for for like this this issue. But right now, like I said, like. We pretty much expect like avian influenza, this strain of avian influenza to kind of like, you know, be staying in the like migrant birds population throughout like the like the continent. And at some point, like the migrant bird population will probably prevail and adapt themselves to that that strain. So like for the right now, like I'd be surprised if we in the short or long term, like we re-engage people on baiting authorization. Okay, I appreciate that uh, that clarity, Christian. Now uh and the reason well, I asked, Jack, Jack, do you have oh, a... Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, if I could just uh, a couple of points. One, first of all, I just want to make it, uh, you know, abundantly clear that the decision to prohibit the uh, main authorities in 2022 had nothing to do with the consultation in 2017. Oh, yeah. It really was, it really was about this uh, avian influenza and our concerns for the the birds that would be baited and then other birds that they might congregate with away from the site. So. Um, you know, we know that um, some many of the birds that uh, are attracted to to bait stations are uh, dabbling ducks in mallards in particular, and probably among the species that are least susceptible to mortality from uh, from a highly pathogenic avian influenza. But those birds then go and roost uh, in other areas that might be frequented by bay ducks that could be quite susceptible to highly pathogenic avian influenza. So. We want to uh, we want to get through a fall season and see what the impact of this outbreak is before we uh, make a, a longer term decision. Uh, one other point on the beta authorizations: um, we are planning to uh, revisit some of the rules and regulations and uh, et cetera uh, with respect to those beta authorizations. As people might not know this, but uh, there's been no update or change to any of the uh, the rules or the requirements or criteria since the beta th authorizations were first implemented in the early 1970s. And um, I think we want to update that and ensure that um, while we're issuing beta authorizations that we uh, are getting the, the habitat conservation benefits that they were initially designed to uh, promote. So there will be some consultation. There, it will not be done without consultation. There will be some consultation, but we are planning to update uh, in the next few years um, some of the criteria and requirements for those beta authorizations. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, yeah, Jack, Jack, Jack uh, help me remind me of one of my file. It's been so long that I haven't had traction on this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I only ask because we have heard some, you know, some conspiracy theories, let's call them what they are really, is that, you know, uh, CWS's decision to uh, not issue beta authorizations this year would be used as a catalyst to not ever issue them again. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to be crystal clear, you know, what, what discussions were occurring internally if we expect to have that conversation again in the future, what consultation we might expect. And, and I appreciate you being uh, crystal clear on that, Jack and yep. Chris. Um, I'm going to uh, dial back very quickly to a couple questions that were um, in the Q&A. One is about uh, the crossbows. I uh, asked a question about the, um, the minimum blade size. Um, is there a uh, minimum, what are the minimum draw requirements or um, you know, feet per second? Is there a, a minimum power requirement for, uh, for a crossbow? Is that written in regulation or... Yes, just give me a second. I'm going to look quickly at the regulations because it's not one of those regulations. Or Greg, do you have it in front of yeah. you? Uh, yes, it is. The minimum draw weight is uh, 45 kilograms. And that, that makes it consistent with most crossbow regulations across Canada. Same so it's more, it's more about the draw weight rather than, you know, like a minimum feet per second, right. you know, of, okay. It has to be something we could measure in the field if it was ever required. And feet per second would be difficult. Draw weight, we can measure that with a bow scale. It's a good point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm just quickly uh, bear with me for a moment here. I'm going through the several questions that have uh, that have come in here. Um, 
somebody's asking if you want to transport migratory birds to a charitable event, do you need any extra permits other than uh, the hunter's migratory game bird permit that they use to harvest the ducks in the first place? I don't think so, but you would. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's the, the five day after the close of the season has been repealed. Uh, the only caveat that's included now in regulation is the birds must be preserved before you can give them to the charitable organization. Right, right. So they can't just be plucked and eviscerated. It has to go with that extra step and preserve them before donating them, correct? If they can't come right from the marsh to the, to the <laughs> vineyard, they have to go home and be processed and preserved. Okay, perfect. Um, so going back quickly to uh, the youth permit and the mentoring, this is one that has uh, garnered quite a bit of attention uh, prior to the event and even tonight in the Q&A. Someone's asking, uh, when somebody turns, let's say it's me, when I turn 18, can I be a mentor to someone under 18? Because in theory that I, having just turned 18, would not have had a migratory game bird license when I was over 18. That would be my first year as an adult, as a legal adult with a migratory game bird hunting license. Uh, but does it count if I've had um, uh, multiple licenses previous to turning 18, prior to turning 18? And the regulation or reads that the minor, uh, the, the, the minor must be accompanied by someone who's not a minor. Minor is defined as someone who has not reached the age of 18. Okay. So that would be 17. So if you were 18 and you had purchased a permit or held a permit when you were 17, yeah, I would think you would qualify as a mentor. Okay, perfect. So as long as you have one previous migratory game bird hunting permit and the current years, even yeah. if you're 18, you can act as a mentor. That's correct. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to quickly lean on my colleague, Matt DeMille, who has been curating the Q&A tonight to see if he has any questions he would, uh, he would like to ask. Matt, are you, uh, are you available to chime in here? Thanks, Mark. There's uh, most of the questions have been uh, answered, at least the ones within um, scope of the modernization. Um, there is there are some questions around uh, wastage, although not necessarily specific to the, the modernization, but related to um, whether the legs and thighs on migratory game birds uh, are required to be to be kept. Um, and so I think they're referring to, you know, um, usage uh, versus wastage in this case. That's a very good question. And it's a loaded question, right? Like there's a lot of people who have very strong opinion on this one. So we didn't make a call for the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll see like, this is one of those situations where we decided to not put like, very strong language in the regulation. We'll see how people like, you know, kind of like avoid wastage. If we realize in the future or if there's a huge pressure from the hunters that, you know, we should include the wool birds, then maybe we will try to consider how we could amend the regulations to include this. But for the moment, like, you know, if you press the birds, you're not gonna be like charged, like it's not, it, it's, it's not gonna be wastage. So like there's, it's, you're not forced to use the wool birds. Like we're not gonna force you to use the gimlets either. Like for the moment, like you need to make sure to use the birds as much as you can. Thank you. And, and there is uh, one other question here um, and this may have been answered and I, I apologize, but it might be worth reiteration. Uh, it's around um, birds that are gifted and so having a non-hunter and whether there are uh, limitations on the number of preserved uh, birds uh, that a non-hunter can be gifted. If they're preserved, like, then there's no limitation. However, like if, if they're not preserved, then there's going to be a possession limit. So if you're giving birds away and they're not preserved, like the possession limit will apply. Okay, thank you. I just looking quickly here, and uh, I don't see any other questions unless you do, Mark. I think Mark, you're on mute. Hit the button one too many times here. 
There we go. Um, I have a few questions that were provided ahead of time that are more related to um, specific hunting regulations in Ontario. Uh, so if there are no ad additional questions related to the modernization or some of these new concepts and permits that have been introduced, uh, we can ask a few questions um, about Ontario specific hunting regulations if uh, everybody is amenable. Yeah, that's fine, Mark. Perfect. We can start off with um, a what I think is a simple question. The answer may not be simple, but um, uh, why is there a, someone is asking, why is there a period between, uh, this is, sorry, this is related to goose seasons. Why is there a period between the early season and the regular season in uh, the southern region of Ontario? Why is there a, I think it's, if I remember correctly, it's a week long break. There's a, a week of hunting, a break, and then um, uh, a longer season uh, till the end of the year. Yep. So those early Canada goose seasons were are specifically designed to target um, locally breeding, temperate breeding Canada geese, and to avoid harvesting um, subarctic breeding Canada geese. And so the earlier in the season that you have the hunting season, the more likely you are to harvest uh, temperate breeding Canada geese and to not harvest those uh, subarctic ones. Also, um, there were people that were not happy with having the Canada goose season go right up against the opening day of the duck season because similar to uh, what I, that my comment earlier about the waterfowl or heritage days, people were concerned about their duck hunting spot being busted out uh, the day before they wanted to go hunting ducks by goose hunters. And so um, having a week long break allows the ducks in a given wetland or lake or river to settle back down a bit. And, uh, and it gives those, those folks that are interested in, a, in an opening day hunt to have a, a better chance at that. Uh, we do have a limited number of total days we can harvest Canada geese under the convention, 107 days. And so we couldn't keep the season open from the earliest possible date right through to the end anyway. And so we thought that a, a good time to have a break would be in between that early season and the opening day of the duck season. And is that, is that does it seem like that has accomplished, you know, the goal of uh, reducing some of those conflicts that you mentioned? We have not, uh, well, it probably has in the sense that we don't get a lot of calls complaining about it anymore. Which we, <laughs> Uh, so in that sense, I think I think so. Certainly, from band recoveries, we know that the early, the, the very early season is very successful at uh, targeting temperate breeding geese and not uh, subarctic breeders. So from that from that point of view, it's very successful having that uh, that early season as early as possible. Perfect. Now there are still some somewhat unique regulations and timing in. Wildlife Management Unit 94, is that correct? Yes. That's, that, and can you explain uh, for the folks that are that are here just a bit of rationale why that remains different and unique? Yeah, um, so based on, again, on, on uh, migration patterns that we, we've observed and from band recoveries, we know that uh, Wildlife Management Unit 94 has a very high proportion of the Southern James Bay population of Canada geese migrating through in the fall. And, um, that population, while relatively stable for the last several years, is a very small subpopulation. It's only about 100,000 geese in total. And so um, we are concerned about, uh, with increasing bag limits too much that we're going to drive that population into a downward trend. Um, and so we did liberalize uh, one, one extra bird because we do recognize that there are also a lot of temperate breeding geese in that area. And we certainly don't want to restrict people any more than we have to. But uh, I think there's always going to be some concern about that, that very small population that breeds in Southern James Bay uh, in Northern Ontario. In fact, um, we actually put similar restrictions in in Eastern Ontario for the first time in a long time because the Atlantic population of Canada geese, which nests in Northern Quebec mainly and migrates through Eastern Ontario also showed some uh, alarming signs of decline recently. 
And so we've put some uh, mid-season uh, restrictions on, on the bag limit of uh, Atlantic population geese. Hopefully they're just temporary. Uh, we had a couple of years because of the pandemic that we weren't able to uh, conduct our normal monitoring programs in the north. And so we have a bit of a, a, bit of a blind spot there for, for now, but we were able to get up uh, this year and, and we will next. And it looks like the population might be beginning to recover a bit. Um, any of those um, Arctic goose populations, it's, um, those conditions in the north can be very favorable and, and they can be very poor. It's a boom and bust type of situation. And so we could, if we get a couple of boom years, we'll be right back to where we were and we'll be able to lift all those restrictions. But uh, for now, uh, we're just trying to be uh, thinking about the long term and, and being a bit cautious. Okay. okay. Perfect. Oh, is, is, I'm hearing feedback. Is that, can everybody hear me okay? I can. Perfect. I get a little bit of echo here. Um, we have a couple, a uh, few more questions here, um, some of which I think have we've touched on, but would benefit from a little bit of additional clarity. And then we could probably wrap it up if there are no more, um, if nothing, uh, if there's nothing else that uh, CWS staff want to share, or if uh, no other questions are coming in through the Q and A. Um, one is related to um, uh, sandhill cranes. We know that. Um, I don't necessarily expect an answer uh, from CWS by any means, but I will take the opportunity to admit or to uh, uh, provide a little bit of insight about what the OFAH is doing, um, uh, try to get a Sandhill crane hunt. We sit on the Ontario Waterfowl Advisory Committee uh, with Jack and his colleagues and uh, uh, representatives from Delta Waterfowl. And um, as most people know, uh, within the OFAH, a Sandhill crane hunt is something that our members have been pushing for for, for quite some time now. And we continue to lobby um, uh, for that uh, through OWAC and uh, to CWS. Um, so we're not there yet. There are some barriers that need to be overcome. Um, and, and we can maybe talk them uh, about those barriers if we wish, but uh, without um, beating a dead horse by any means, uh, I will simply say that the OFH continues to consider Sandhill crane hunting, uh, getting a hunt in Ontario uh, to be a priority. So um, from our perspective, that's all uh, I'll say at this point, but I will provide uh, you, Jack, with an opportunity. If you want to say anything, I certainly don't want to put you on the spot. Um, uh, or pressure you into uh, sharing anything that you're not ready to share yet. But um, we did receive quite a few questions about Sandhill cranes uh, and a possibility of a future hunt there. So, Yeah, I guess I would just say uh, that um, we are certainly well aware of uh, OFA's interest in uh, promoting a Sandhill crane hunt in Ontario. And it, it's been a longstanding uh, request, that's for sure. Um, and uh, I think, it, I guess I would say, I, we appreciate your patience. Um, uh, seriously, uh, like the Canadian Wildlife Service is not against uh, sandhill crane hunting season in Ontario on principle. Uh, there is sandhill crane hunting in Western Canada um, uh, uh, that's regulated by the Canadian Wildlife Service in that part of the country. It's a different population though, which is much larger than the Ontario population. Mm -hmm. the, it's the mid-continent population in Ontario. That's it's what's referred to as the Eastern population. And so um, given this relatively small size of the Eastern population, it's not really possible, uh, at least it's believed to not really be possible to manage the harvest um, sustainably with a simple bag limit and season length. And so um, although the Eastern population is now hunted in a couple of US states, they are hunted with a tag system so that they can very closely control the number of birds that are harvested. Um, we have explored that possibility for Ontario as well, but the Canadian Wildlife Service has never issued um, tags for harvest of migratory game birds, and it would be a, a quite significant uh, resource requirement for us to develop that system. And so right now we're just not in a position to be able to do that. Um, we are taking one sort of last look at uh, what might be possible in terms of a, a restricted area, restricted bag limit, and restricted season length. And we do hope to provide some kind of an assessment to the, uh, the OFA representatives at our next meeting or, or a subsequent meeting. I'm not sure we'll be quite ready mm -hmm. at the next one. We haven't given up on the idea. I just want people to know, though, that um, uh, the population is actually quite small. 
and sandhill cranes um, are not highly productive like mallards and Canada geese. They don't have broods of five, six, seven, eight, ten young each year. Uh, they're lucky if they have one young per, per, per couple per year. And so they, they are uh, highly vulnerable to overharvest if we're not careful. So uh, just to reiterate, we're not against it in principle, but we're trying to do the right thing for the long-term uh, health of the population and for hunters in Ontario. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate the uh, the insight. Um, we've done quite a bit of communication uh, back and forth with hunters and clubs who continue to advocate for or to continue to pressure us to advocate for mm -hmm. a sandhill crane hunt and we've shared many of those uh you know the content of many of the discussions that we've had and uh i think there's value in hearing it directly from uh from cws so i appreciate you uh providing that clarity there yeah, sure. um so i'm going to while i quickly go through my list of questions i'm going to throw it uh back to my colleague matt DeMille. he has a couple of questions um uh, related to uh, that youth permit again. And then if there's nothing else, we will probably wrap it up. So Matt, are you uh, you with us? Thanks, Mark. Yes, uh, th there has been quite a bit of confusion uh, around the youth hunting requirements for migratory birds. And so uh, if I had to synthesize all the questions into one, it, it would be, are, are youth permit holders hunting in Ontario required to share a firearm with their mentor? And uh, I think the confusion probably comes from um, the different terminology that's used uh, federally and provincially. So, you know, we're talking about a youth permit. We have apprentice hunting in Ontario. You know, there's minors permits for firearms. And so it becomes very confusing for people what the requirements are federally. And I'm just wondering uh, if we could get some clarity for um, all the participants on that. So... What I can say is that, you know, from, from, for the migrating birds on tank permit, like there's no restriction like, regarding the use of firearm. But I will acknowledge that I might not be familiar with the hunting regulations in Ontario. So if there's provincial regulations regarding mentors specific to like the Ontario province, then there might be, there might be uh, the need to use only one shotgun between uh, the mentor and the mentee, but it's not in the migrant birds regulation. So in the migrant birds regulations, like all we say is that the mentor needs to be, like the mentee needs to be accompanied by a mentor that I already bought in the past a migrant game bird permit. And so those are those are the rules for like the or, or mentee, like or the like the yacht permit. Uh, I don't know if somebody from Ontario could like chime in on like possible regulations at the provincial level, but like I'm not familiar with those regulations. Yeah, I'm not either, Christian. Uh, you gave the same answer I would have given. It's uh, we we probably should inform ourselves about that, but we yeah. do have uh, several provinces to deal with, which could have different regulations, and uh, we just don't have the answer this evening, unfortunately. But uh, there's certainly, as Christian said, there's there's nothing in the federal regulations that prohibit both the mentor and mentee from having a shotgun. So I, th I think that is a very important distinction and, and, and thank you for that. And I think that that uh, probably does help to, to clear up some of the confusion in that there is nothing federally that would override the provincial regulations that require uh, youth without their own firearms license. So apprentices to have um, a single firearm shared between the mentor and the mentee. So I think that reiteration that it's important to check uh, the Ontario hunting regulation summary when when um, thinking about that. That's right. Perfect, thanks Matt, I appreciate that. Um, I went through the list of uh, questions and it looks like we have pretty well exhausted uh, most of the content. I think a lot of the um, questions that were provided in advance uh, uh, Chris, you did a very good job of uh, working those into your presentation and uh, some of the conversations that we had afterwards. So. Um, if there's nothing else that anyone from CWS, including Craig, would like to share or plug any programs, any reminders you would like to, uh, uh, to deliver to people, um, I'll pause briefly to see if there are. Well, obviously, like we talked a little bit about bending today, so mm -hmm. as usual, like very important to report your bends. It's a great source of information for us. I know, like, you know, in the last few years, reporting rate went up because like now you can use your cell phone to report your band, but this is this is definitely like something that hunters can help us with. Also, 
if you're randomly selected for enter like surveys, like we really appreciate when you take the times to like answer the questions. Like they, we do use them like you new know, for harvest management. Same things with the part collection surveys. We always appreciate when you like you know take the time to collect the parts and send them to them. Like it's an important source of information, and we really appreciate like the hunters who take the time to do that. You took the words right out of my mouth. Just there you go. <laughs> Uh, before I sign off, Craig or Bridget, anything you uh, would like to add? Just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate, Mark. Um, anytime that we have a chance to discuss this kind of information with, with hunters, it's, it's a benefit to us and it's a benefit to them. So mm -hmm. thanks again. Hopefully we can keep up the relationship. Excellent. Yeah, and maybe just quickly, uh, I'll throw in there that, um, you know, Jack mentioned we didn't get a chance uh, for the last couple of years to do a lot of our, our monitoring and surveys of barfowl and this year was uh, was a good year we've been out and um, based on preliminary analyses it looks like fall flight's going to be pretty good maybe even above average in Ontario um, for ducks and geese depending on how uh, HPAI rolls into that but uh, so far the forecast I think is slightly above average despite you know abnormally dry conditions in parts of the province so that to look forward to oh that that is a perfect positive note on which to end the evening Bridget so thank you for that and thank you all for joining us tonight uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude uh, to everyone from CWS for taking the time out of their evenings uh, to share this information with us and answer these questions um, a reminder to everyone that a recording uh, will be made available uh, and everyone who registered will receive an email notification when it's ready uh, and if there's an opportunity we will try to share some of the links that we think are relevant to some of the questions that were asked in the email that goes out to uh to people who registered when we send out the notification of the recording so with that thank you all again i appreciate this um and uh we'll be in touch soon